uh, with the Association of Legal Administrators. And welcome to today's webinar, uh, sponsored by Delegate, um, IT Department of the Future, advice from your peers. Um, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. Okay, so um, first we have uh, Cindy. She is our IT manager with Estella. We have Abby joining us, who is a senior paralegal at Neil and McDevitt. We have Kristen. She is a national account executive with Delegate. And we have Sharon joining us, who is a managing director with Delegate. All right, and now let's get started, Sharon. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, thank you, Regina, for setting this up for us today. Uh, our goal today is to identify some of the changes impacting the uh, impacting IP administration. We're going to walk through some of our market research uh, that we conducted with your peers and uh, just share some more stories from the panel. I'm sorry. I'm so let's start with the drivers for change. We have been seeing so much change going on in IP and IP administration in particular. Uh, firm consolidations, so what happens when uh, two firms consolidate? What happens to all the portfolios uh, and all of the uh, various uh, systems that are in place and how do you bring those resources uh, together? Uh, and um, there's been uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, issues that have come up with that and uh, 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 budget pressures. Of always there's budget pressures, in particular lately because patent valuations are down. There's been an increased need from corporations uh, to manage their IP uh, in, a, uh, in a more efficient way. Market pressures, experience strain, uh, the legislative and judicial changes that are happening within the within the market, and um, and uh, when you think about some of these uh, some of these huge changes, both in within companies and uh, from outside forces, uh, it can really impact the, the 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 IP department and management management of the IP department. So in particular, I think one of the things that have come up uh, and one of the strongest changes that came up in our market research was budget. So I'd like to ask the panel for their thoughts. Uh, and Abby, in particular, uh, had talked about some of the budget challenges her firm has been facing from their clients. Thanks, Sharon. So some of the issues that um, my firm is seeing is just a requirement for really accurate estimates. You know. Typically, when you think of an estimate, you think of around kind of in the neighborhood of what it's going to cost. But we're finding more and more that clients are really wanting a pretty precise estimate, which can be um, easy to provide in transactional situations, but it's more difficult when we're dealing with complex legal issues. So in those instances, we try to usually provide a, a reasonable range um, you know, we know clients don't like 1,000 to 2,000 because that range is too big, but maybe 1,000 to 1,500 is um, more palatable. And when we're dealing with complex legal situations, we might also provide different estimates for different scenarios. Uh, can be get a little messy if you're trying to have streamlined communication with our client, but it can help them weigh which option they want to take. And then, of course, just providing updated estimates, especially if you're in a negotiation situation, you can provide an initial estimate for the first few hours, and then from there, maybe update your estimate. Great. I don't know, uh, Chris, if you uh, want to kind of weigh in uh, when you think about some of the experiences you've had with budget. Absolutely, and I've had the advantage of sitting on both sides of the desk, both as an IP administrator and now on the sales side. And increasingly over the last 10 years, as I've gone out and spoken to clients, they basically have told me that even with the tools that they can access freely uh, via the web, 
they're finding that the cost estimates are very much underestimated and that when they turn around to actually affect filings, you're seeing, you know, anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars more than what's projected. And as all of you know from the legal side, you never want to go back to your client and say, oh, and by the way, it's going to cost you $30,000 more. And on the corporate side, you don't want to receive that information as well. So I think there's a greater focus today, um, so again, looking at making sure we have accurate numbers to go to both our clients and to come back to our corporations with. And I know in my past experience, my ever first foreign filing, and this is, I'll tell you, back when Madonna had her first uh, single, my general counsel had received the PCT information from our outside counsel, and he says, oh, sure, Chris, just tell them to file in every country. And again, I'm like, are you sure? And he's like, absolutely. Let me just tell you, I had to pick that poor man up off the floor once he figured out the damage we had done when we said go into every country. So we try to avoid situations like that these days through the use of the tools and technology we have available. And what about you, Cindy? Do you have any uh, 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 issues that come up uh, within your organization regarding budget? Um, yes, and we're currently going through it right now. We're um, trying to get all of our tools and, and everything lined up. We um, not only ask our outside counsel, but we run the different tools that we have um, by seeing what costs, and then a lot of prediction, running dockets. I mean, I do a lot of it manually still, just because it comes becomes accurate, and then um, cross-checking, so my figures versus the law firm figures and somewhere in between is how I usually do it. That's um, it, Budgets are very hard to do, but I think you can get pretty close to it if you really work at it. And I, it's it's a huge undertaking every year, but things that have to be done. But we rely a lot on our outside counsel and then um, also our internal people. So, uh, you know, what we've, what we've seen is uh, an increase with our clients. So we've seen an increasing need to get um, budgets for the year nailed down. Uh, and providing estimates for the year based upon current activities and um, uh, you know estimates on how that might change or not change for the next year, and I think it's one of the uh, forecasting tools that we have available that it's been uh, well received. Um, so I agree with that. You know, one of the other big uh, one of the other big pressures that came up from this market research study that we did, and we did this market research study, I should mention, across the U.S. and Canada with uh, leaders, uh, IP administration leaders, department heads, and um, uh, 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 department heads within corporations and law firms. And we uh, got the responses back. And I'm, uh, in sharing that, this, this, uh, this drivers for change were the top mentions for what is driving change within the organization. By far, by far, the first five were uh, listed here were the ones that were um, uh, were identified as the most um, impactful, and one of them was experience drain. There's a lot of concern around experience drain with turnover within the departments, with uh, both the paralegal staff uh, as well as the legal administration staff and attorneys. Uh, primarily the, the sort of uh, uh, first seven years uh, associates um, and that experience drain of moving and moving from one place to the other and how it impacts the group. And that was another area that has come up that, um, that really impacted the group. So I don't know, uh, uh, Abby, is this something that, um, that has come up within your organization? Sure. Um, turnover and staffing, it's, it's a, that's an issue that every industry faces. And in the legal industry, it's been, I think, historically a bit lower. The turnover rates have been lower, but that's, we've been seeing that increasing steadily um, over the past several years. And I think one of the big issues that I know law firms face, and I'm sure companies face as well, um, is the amount of time and money it takes to train new employees, even an experienced employee who comes on, because there's always a ramping up period. And for someone who's um, maybe relatively inexperienced, that ramp up time is even a little bit more. And sometimes 
see team members will leave so early that you're not even able to get them to a point where they're billing profitably, and that's always a struggle for um, for law firms. And I think another issue in some law firms can also be not necessarily turnover, but expansion. A law firm might be taking on more clients, might have high profile cases, and I know that's something that my law firm faced, and so sometimes we're adding members to the team rather than trying to replace somebody who's left. So yes, turnover and experience train is definitely something we're facing in the law firm environment. Uh, what about you, Cindy? What's your, been your experience on the, corp, on the corporate side? Um, pretty much what Abby said. We, it's hard to get um, new people, and especially people with experience or even training them, and then you know they have to have somebody there for a couple of years for it to start paying off. So keeping the initiative, and um, I think a lot of it has to do with the, the self-motivation and initiative of people in the companies to, you know, make it worthwhile for them to stay and to be a part of the team. Great. I don't know, Kristen, if you had anything you wanted to add. Absolutely. I'm a huge proponent in investing in people and also the transfer of knowledge. And again, just speaking amongst the industry, I'm not always seeing that knowledge transferred shared um, amongst the team. So I think it's when you empower employees and, as Cindy say, give them some incentive to stay, that you're going to build a good team. Look, everybody loves praise and a pat on the back. And everybody also, you know, if they're sitting in our position in IP, they want to learn. So I, I just encourage everybody, you know, let's share the knowledge, let's sort of spread the love, and let's train those who follow in our footsteps to be as good as we are. And I'm sure everybody on the phone feels that way, that we need to train everybody to do our job, and God forbid an emergency pops up, somebody leaves unexpectedly, something happens in somebody's life. It's always great to be proactive, again, whether it's through training the people who work for us mm -hmm. or even relying on the tools and technology that is out there. Nobody can predict tomorrow, so, you know, planning for emergencies and investing mm -hmm. in the future through knowledge is important. Great. So what it leaves us with is, you know, just that need uh, to uh, to really manage that change and create that environment where uh, we have that, you know, IC, IP support teams that are really able to uh, to manage that change. So now we're going to go into the heart of the market research that we talked about. And um, and one of the uh, uh, exercises we conducted was uh, we asked uh, about 65 questions out to this group, and I've just put a few in uh, into this presentation. I uh, I wouldn't be able to get it all out to you guys in in an hour, uh, maybe a day, but uh, it's really good information. And uh, I tried to pick the things that are relevant um, they're relevant to uh, to this group. And one of the questions we asked the group was, what do you plan to do in 2018 to address? And I put the top mentions here, uh, and uh, the top mentions are headcount reductions, outsourcing some administrative functions, uh, filing, maintaining fewer jurisdictions, um, providing fixed fees, so it, it asking for fixed fees or providing fixed fees um, uh, for U.S. or Canadian local firms, uh, as well as foreign firms, and then uh, consolidating, uh, consolidating all of the the, the foreign and, and local firms. So instead of having you know so many to to work with, consolidating and having, um, and the reason for that is having a little bit of a higher um, volume to work with, and maybe negotiating fees in a different way. So those were some of the 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 changes uh, or, or the solutions that um, that um, the various uh, uh, representatives uh, in this sample had uh, had put forth. Then we asked a lot about the team. Uh, currently, you know, sizes of teams, which functions people have within the role. So a lot of information on that um, that's really helpful for us as we think about the market. But one of the things that came up was um, when we asked them, it was really 
eye-popping for me was, is your team equipped to handle changes? And 73% of them said, no, they are not ready for changes. And then we asked a follow-up question for those that said, um, my team is not ready. We asked them um, whether they would be looking externally or internally. And the answer was they would be looking externally for 67. So that 67% of the 73% said that they would be looking externally. And when we asked what skills are needed uh, for the folks that didn't think they were going to be ready, um, there were a lot of analytical skills, a lot of um, data and reporting skills, presentation skills, business development, client communication, organizational design, these kinds of skills. And the ones that were receding in need were uh, skills that are in administrative or docketing and um, and thinking uh, uh, and thinking about uh, uh, what were the skills that were needed. So that was actually quite surprising. And I think the other um, uh, the other information that came out for me um, in this study that was pretty marked was that um, that their that their team has a good understanding and use of data within within their um, uh, within their department. And um, the answer was really they don't, they don't agree with that statement. They they strongly disagree with that statement. So most don't. And um, and I'd be curious about uh, about what you're seeing um, within the firm uh, or a corporation uh, for uh, for data and analytics and reporting. Uh, what are you seeing at your firm, uh, Abby? As of right now, this seems to be mostly outsourced um, to vendors, but that is just kind of where we're at right now, and that's not to say it won't change in the future. Obviously, we have our eye on this, but as of right now, it is being outsourced to third-party experts. What about you, Cindy? Same here. It's, it's outsourcing, um, but it's also a knowledge of data. You know, I mean, you need your people that that are um, used to having the data, being very skilled and being able to retrieve it and get things out. Um, but right now it's probably 50-50. We use a lot of external. So um, are you are you seeing that as a as maybe a requirement or a job uh, benefit to uh, to having that experience within your firm, within your I corporation? I would think so. Yes. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. The more right. information you can get in the whole world is going, you know, electronically and the more knowledge that you have in that area, I think is more, is a lot more beneficial. Yeah. What are some other skills that you see from your seat that you, you uh, have been trying to um, encourage your team to develop uh, as some of these changes have, um, have been, uh, have been happening? Well, right now we're still in a growing phase, and we're not real sure where it's all going to bottom out. So I can't really make a make a judgment call on that. I'm hoping that as we everything gets to a level that we can start performing at that level, that we'll have all of our ducks in a row. But right now, I, it's too early to say. Great. Is there anything uh, that uh, you would add, Kristen, to some of the things we've talked about regarding team? No, Sharon, I, I actually agree with both ladies on um, what you know what's going on in the industry. Ever since the birth of big data and the need for analytics, it, there's been a a basic, you know, split between the offshoring of the business and keeping it internally. I know, again, back when I was an administrator, we used to have to do all our analytics, basically relying on our docket system and our knowledge. So I'm glad to see that, you know, once this data comes to the forefront, that we have greater tools to help us get from point A to point B. Great. So one of the so the, now we're going to get into the advice from peers. So when we asked, um, you know, what are uh, what are some of the steps that you're taking uh, to manage this uh, uh, moving forward? And then we had a, a roundtable about this topic um, at a recent um, uh, at a recent conference 
with some IP administrators, and uh, I think we were in May, and we developed. And here's what we what, here's what came out of that um, out of that session, and I think this is really good. Um, this is really good advice, and it's really thinking about developing an IP staff of specialists capable of high-value strategic discussions. And that means those that can partner with clients or business units to, uh, to uh, think ahead and be more proactive and provide those proactive insight, insights to make better informed decisions. So not being just re reactive, well, you know, we, what's the price of this and what's the price of that and here's your information, but really being proactive and bringing that to the group. Um, and really educating the business on the IP function. I also think uh, what came out of this was there's a lot of ideas that come from executive leadership that make determinations on what, um, what we should or shouldn't do within the organization without a real deep understanding of what's actually done within the organization. So this group of, of uh, about 10 um, uh, folks at the round table said one of the main things that they really wanted to start doing um, is starting to educate the business on the on the function within the department and not and not um, and not uh, letting um, uh, others speak for them uh, who may not have a deep understanding of what's happening within the group and um, uh, and in order to do that and I, and I really felt they felt the group that we were with really felt empowered when we left this session they felt like this was the top three things they were going to focus on and really making sure that they understood deeply what their teams know and don't know and what their skills are so that they could uh, fill in those gaps provide training um, that's needed and I think Kristen hit it uh, right on the head and that is do a lot of cross training so that they're not left with gaps um, if uh, whatever unforeseen event might happen and really creating those skills to better partner with these uh, clients or business units because oftentimes the firm uh, paralegals are the uh, client facing um, connection and communication points and um, within the business unit oftentimes they are as well. Uh, and then those proactive insights really building those uh, uh, sort of regular touch points and regular reports that um, help the, uh, uh, the department um, or clients really make better informed decisions and really adding value uh, to that function. And I thought this was a really good session and I felt it was like one that was, um, that these were some of the key um, um, insights that came from that. I guess I'd, I'd be uh, interested, uh, Cindy, in what you think in terms of these uh, these top uh, these top ideas that came out of that group. I think these are um, very well founded. It's it's education and being proactive, getting getting right to the source of um, the decisions, trusting your people to give out that information, and um, I, I think these. I think hit right on target. What about you, Abby, from a firm perspective? Yeah, so I think um, speaking from kind of the legal administrator, paralegal perspective in a law firm, you know, I think the legal administrator has to be really proactive and anticipate issues down the line for their client and also to help streamline processes and communication between the client and the attorney and kind of handling um, certain communications or processes that don't need to be handled directly by an attorney but just need attorney oversight. And I think the legal administrator also has to act kind of as a sounding board for the client and the attorney and keep the client's big picture strategy in mind on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think these points really touch on all of that. Um, and I think, you know, from a law firm perspective, we're always happy to um, help our clients to the extent that they're actually in an IP group. Um, sometimes we're dealing with clients that, that don't have a separate IP group, but to certainly provide education for their business or to help them in some way by maybe even just writing an email or preparing a presentation or actually giving a presentation to their business folks to help them understand um, the connection between IP and, and the greater business goals. Great. 
Uh, Kristen, so when you think about uh, working with clients on both sides, what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on these? I think Abby made some terrific points as well as Cindy. IP administrators have to wear many hats, and I think the most important thing as an administrator, one thing we can do is be proactive. Be proactive with our staff, with our business leaders, with our inventors, with our clients. The more that we can look forward facing about um, the needs of a business or the needs of a client and looking at the ways we can address those, whether it's through people or whether it's through tools or whether it's through retraining. Um, being proactive to anticipate those needs are one of the pivotal pieces of a uh, IP administrator. And again, forward thinking, looking to the future, watching how the landscape changes. Again, as proactive as we can be to Look, IP is an ever-changing world. It's always good to be ahead of the curve, and I encourage everybody, look to see what's out there. Look at the tools. Look at the people you have, and uh, just let's try to uh, make this a bunch uh, easier on our administrators, even easier on everybody involved in the IP process. Great. And I think that um, uh, one of the areas is identifying the core competencies within your organization and align the staffing, and I think um, all three of our panelists mentioned this, but uh, when you think about, uh, you know, uh, those every department and every operating unit um, is being tasked to understand and concentrate on their core competen competencies. That's been um, one of the, um, you know, one of the big trends uh, within um, uh, within human resources for uh, the last five to ten years. And I think what we see uh, from our seat when we work with many, many clients uh, across uh, the U.S. and Canada in both law firms and in uh, corporations. And, um, and I think that what we see is many of the things we talked about, why um, uh, departments are, are in flux, but what competencies are missing. And really just looking at your staff and thinking about what um, are you asked to do? What are you going to be asked to do within your department? And then really look realistically within your group and see what's missing. And then try to figure out how you're going to get that. And, um, you know, how are you going to manage that department to get you there? Um, and, um, and how are you going to stay on the, uh, you know, how are you going to stay up on the core competencies that are needed? You don't want to be, in my opinion, sort of left flat-footed. Um, if your team is going to be asked to do more uh, analytics tools and reporting, um, then uh, then that's something that you're going to have to sort of figure out within the within your organization. How am I going to get those skills? Um, is it is it basic Excel, Excel skills? Is it reporting uh, skills that you can pull out of all these uh, wonderful tools that are out there, uh, so that you can provide you know here's the decision that needs to be made, and here's all the facts that that are going to help you make that decision. So, um, um, so that's kind of what uh, 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 you know. What are some uh, kind of a path to get there? But I'd be curious about um, about some more stories here. So, so Abby, do you have anything to share? Yeah, sure. So I think you know what I've seen and learned over the years is that the IP administrator is really relied upon heavily in the area of IP because there's a lot of processes and maybe I don't want to say more so than any area of law, but it's definitely at one of the top areas of law where um, a lot of the processes can be completed and managed by the administrator with attorney oversight. And while the administrator can't provide legal advice, they take on a huge responsibility of communicating with the client on pretty much everything else that isn't providing legal advice. Uh, and I think that one of the core competencies of an IP administrator is to understand their client's unique business needs, and that can be your internal clients or your external clients if you're in a law firm environment like I am, and kind of get a big picture strategy for protecting their IP because you're not ever able to cover all bases. So you kind of have to have a tiered approach to what's the most important down to, you know, what are the things we're not, not concerned about but um, maybe less concerned about. 
And I think as far as staffing and managing the department to get there, depending on the portfolio size of a client, you know, you want to staff as many administrators as you can because that's really the key to cost-saving measures for clients is to staff as many legal administrators to do all of that um, legal administrative work that doesn't need to be done directly by an attorney but just with attorney oversight. And I think um, – a way to stay kind of on the cutting edge of the core competencies is, you know, participating in things like this, webinars, staying up to date on relevant newsletters so that you're up to date on the trends and the technology and new tools that can maybe help your workflow go a little bit smoother. Great. Kristen, do you have some more stories? Yeah, I, I think as I look at this um, slide, I think more about staffing issues. I, When I was an administrator, I was never afraid of change. And another thing I was never afraid of was actually looking at my staff, taking metrics on how they performed, what they performed well in, what they may have not performed so well in, and investing in them through, again, webinars, education, whatever needed, whatever they needed to be successful at their job. And for those who didn't quite, you know, get to where they needed to be, repurposing them at something else they were good at. So aligning the staff and making sure they're in the proper knowledge areas, whether it's formalities or U.S. filings, foreign filings, or payments, is just as important um, in optimizing your workflows. So I think as we go to look at the staff and, you know, what they can do, and if they can't do it, you know, let's look at shifting the workload over to third-party experts to get where we need to be. And again, that all centers around change. Don't be afraid to shift some of the work. In the long run, it's going to benefit the business, it's going to benefit you, and it's actually going to bring probably a better work-life balance to everybody involved. Cindy, um, have you uh, gone through, as you think about, um, as you're building your group, um, have you thought about uh, how you're going to sort of manage and stay, uh, uh, stay focused on um, this higher value work? Yes. Um, I, it's up to, it's not only up to uh, the management team, but it's also up to the individual and how motivated they are. Um, for example, I have um, asked for additional responsibilities like due diligence and things. So I think, you know, doing that to round out yourself. Also, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a friend and she said in her firm with the new IPRs, um, she decided since she was the only one that was interested in it or appeared to be that she would really study up on it. And um, they sent her to the school uh, to the patent office. And then she's now the top IPR person as a paralegal. They come to her for um, advice and where they can find the rules. And she files the majority, she said, about 95% of all the IPRs in her law firm. So I think it's also the responsibility of the individual to recreate yourself and to go after things that you think you're weak in. And, and um, for the most part, people are very open to that because there is a need. As an example, my, my friend that is now the IPR specialist in her firm, as a paralegal, she's able to do that. So just knowing what you can do within the legal bounds and um, going after different areas of your life that are lacking where, you're, where your experience is. You know, I think that's actually a really key point to make, and that is um, really creating uh, departments and groups of people who um, really want uh, to learn new things and, and, and fill the void, right? Because I think it's appalling. I don't want to go back to that slide, but I think it's appalling that the leaders um, within the, uh, within the uh, IP space um, that 73% say they don't, their team isn't ready for the future, and if they're going to, if they're going to, uh, 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 they're going to hire externally or think externally to fill that void. Well, I, I actually disagree with that. I think there's uh, a lot of talent and willingness within 
uh, within the IP administrative ranks that really could fill some of this void. Um, and I'm going to uh, I use Cindy as a really, really good example of somebody who uh, looks at challenges in the future and really tries to set herself up for success in a personal way. So she has to take that, um, the, you know, the, the onus is on her to, to develop what, what are the things I need to do and learn, and then how can I get there? And, um, and one of the ways that Cindy has been doing that is, you know, trying to look at uh, what, what are areas that are um, important to the organization uh, where it seems that they're not getting really good answers or they're not, you know, getting good advice or they're spending a lot of money on outside uh, a council to do some of this and maybe there's something that I could step in and do. And I think that's a really important thing to think about it from an individual perspective and how can you motivate individuals to kind of think about it for the future. And here are some questions, really, should I build or hire for this talent? You know, how is this going to help retention? I think one of the things that we didn't really talk about is how you can create retention uh, within your department and with your ranks by providing uh, new uh, skills for uh, groups uh, internally. Um, and then who can provide that training? You know, what organizations are available? Um, I guess, uh, and then what should I shift to a third party? What expertise? And then headcount versus budget. You know, within um, this, this really isn't a law firm issue, but it's it's a bit of a corporate uh, issue. When you have a headcount, uh, sometimes you have a headcount number that you have to hit, but you have uh, more budget. You have a, you can play with the budget, uh, but you can't really impact the, the headcount. Uh, I'll give an example of a client that we had. Uh, where they were in the process of um, they were uh, in the process of merging with another organization, and they could not fill, um, could not have any job openings to fill any job openings. They had to um, keep the headcount that they had with maybe some special circumstances. So, but they had the budget, so they had budget they could use, but they could not hire. So they had to think about that and make a um, and think about how they were going to manage that. But I'd be curious about um, uh, if anyone has any experiences uh, when you think about uh, building or hiring for this talent. Yeah, I can speak to this. Um, I think it's important when you're trying to retain talent, it's important to make sure that those valuable team members, and the valuable team members are usually pretty easy to pick out, I think, in most organizations. Just ensuring that they're appreciated and offered opportunities to grow, to grow within the organization. Um, you know, appreciation can come in many forms. It, I think monetary speaks the biggest volumes, but words of affirmation are important too, or, you know, notes and um, just recognizing that person either privately and saying, hey, I appreciate the work you did, or, and also publicly, I think both are important. Um, to show that they are a valued team member and that their work does not go unnoticed or underappreciated. I think a lot of uh, IP administrators and legal administrators in general really see their jobs as a career rather than just a job. And I think it's important to, um, to treat them as such as, you know, not just an employee, but someone who's trying to grow their career. We should be offering all team members, you know, continuing education opportunities, giving them a variety of projects, new assignments, um, and also looking into what they actually enjoy working on. Uh, we don't all have the luxury of doing only the stuff that we want to do, but, you know, I've learned not to be shy about saying, hey, I love doing this specific type of work. I love working with this particular client and I love focusing on this type of project and just kind of making that known so that um, you can be doing the things that you love as much as possible and of course there's always going to be some of the tasks that maybe aren't so um, aren't as much fun but you still can get a lot out of those things. Um, I think that's great and I uh, remember uh, I had uh, taken over a team and they had the lowest engagement scores of any team in the company and um, and I came in uh, to you know I 
I, I described them as, you know, they're afraid to say yes, they're afraid to say no, they're just afraid. And nobody wanted to come into the department. It was hard for us to fill positions within the department. And really the people who wanted to leave and go to other departments couldn't do that. Um, uh, they, they didn't, their skill set weren't transferring as well um, outside of the group. And, um, and I was sort of at a, you know, sort of at a, a thought, sort of at a, at a ground zero, a very um, unengaged group. And, um, and uh, so put a few things in. And one of the things that was most successful, and it sounds so crazy, but it was two things. It was, um, it was um, meeting uh, uh, weekly with your direct reports. It was a requirement. And you had to ask them uh, three questions. One was, you know, what, you know, what do you need uh, from me to, to move forward today? Um, so, you know, what, what do you need from me? And then uh, one was, um, you know, where are we with sort of, uh, you know, the, the top priorities of the organization? So at first I put the top priorities, you know, what do you need for me to move forward? What, um, where are we with uh, uh, making progress to those top priorities? And then who should I thank? Meaning who has helped you move things forward within the organization and who should I thank? And we ended up by thanking, you know, you would then you, you as the leader, as the, as the manager, you would then thank the, the, the people and let them know that, you know, you know, Cindy, if, if Cindy reported to me and Cindy said, you know, you really need to thank Abby, then I would send Abby a note and said, hey, Cindy told me this wonderful thing that you did to help us move forward on our top priority. And I really appreciate that could be internal or external. And um, that made the biggest impact within the organization. So I think Abby hit it right on the head, really individualize it and make sure that everybody is, um, is feeling like they have a part of this future. So it was pretty powerful. Um, is there anything that you, uh, Cindy, would add to this uh, to this uh, slide? No. Um, the only thing, Abby made all the all the points that I would have said, but um, I also think it's it's important to push people. You know, kind of test your your uneasiness, and whether that's yourself doing it to yourself or a supervisor acknowledging that they could do this, this extra thing and, you know, make it kind of, don't make it a challenge, but make it, you know, as I, I see potential in this and please, you know, help me out here. What do you think, you know, and have an open communication. Great. Uh, Kristen, do you have anything to add? Absolutely. You know, I, I look at this slide and I think about the first time I ever went into the IP firm to learn about patents. And MPEP was thrown at me. And for those of you who are probably as old as I am, you know that book's about five inches thick. And I was told if I wanted to be a good IP paralegal, I need to read the book from cover to cover. In my naivety and being a young person, I absolutely did. So as I look about, you know, training and education, I think about the steps I took in my own career where I actually started out in the formalities department. And at that time when we trained new individuals, the individuals had to learn every conceivable aspect of patent prosecution. We all had to be proficient at each and every step. And the firm I worked for, of course, was willing to train us, re-educate us, anything we needed to move along. So I definitely think investing in your employees is pivotal. And then I also look at the shifting to a third party. And, you know, if you look at how things have progressed over the years, it was shifting maintenance fee payments, shifting IDSs, and then, you know, there's a couple other things that were shifting in the future. But I don't know if I want to look at it as shifting so much as giving them tools. Give, give, these, give your staff members tools to help them do their jobs more effectively. Tools to test their own knowledge. That's one thing I've heard all throughout these conversations is about pushing yourself, testing yourself. And I used to sit there with the tools and say, okay, I know this due date for this. What does this provider say it is? And again, it's all about learning. IP is constantly learning, whether it's investing in yourself, have others invest in you, or even challenging providers with the tools they provide. IP can be fun and rewarding. So again, investing in talent, not being afraid to give them the tools, 
And the best thing you can ever do to empower your staff is give them a pat on the back and say thank you for all your hard work. Very good. Oh, so sorry. now, uh, Sharon, I do have a question I wanted to bring okay. up quickly that the audience yeah, sure. has asked. Um, yeah, sure. So going back to the slide that said companies are looking externally for skills needed, um, how do you show your bosses that you're willing to work on attaining new skills so that your company doesn't look externally? I think that's a good question. I I think um, I know for myself, uh, I I've always looked at um, uh, I've always looked at the the landscape and sort of thought, well, where is the vacuum? Where is something needed? And then uh, putting myself out there, but I never just walk in and say, gee, you know, <laughs> I'd I'd like to do that new thing uh, because I'd like to learn that. Uh, what I try to do is is position myself as the right person to do that. So not just that, uh, that, there's, that there's an opening or there's an opportunity, but that there's an actual, that I am the right person. So I think about the skills that are needed to learn that set and what I can you know, draw upon in my past. And I create a sort of mini business case and I bring that in um, uh, to I, whenever I've had that opportunity. And I've really typically been fairly successful not always of course but i've been fairly successful and then i always give them the here's here's what's here's the the problem here's the solution and here's here's my and i'm very um directive and here's and here's uh uh why i'm the person to do it and here's the next steps i need to do step one two three four five and then they they, they they're relieved right so somebody's thought about it they thought what needs to get done they're ready to move on it they've given me whatever is needed it might be a class as cindy mentioned somebody needs to go in and get education they need to get up to speed they need to um uh you know uh, uh you know get get a new tool in internally so that uh it can be uh it can be utilized in this particular case so i think for me it's always been that little bit of a um seeing the vacuum and seeing the, the the opportunity and kind of racing in there but being very prepared um so that that they, they walk out of there thinking yep i'm glad sharon's on the team and she's on it so that's my that's my experience what about you cindy have all your eggs in a row how you want to do it how you're going to prepare what you need for help asking someone is this something you think i can do because i can go and and I have everything spelled out that, you know, these are my tools that I, w I can obtain it. I'm very interested in it. I'm, you know, I'm motivated. And usually if you approach somebody, they're willing to let you go with it. So, yes, I agree with you, Sharon. So, would Abby, do you have any uh, anything you'd like to add? That's a really good, great question. Yeah, so I think uh, something to add is, you know, you, Sharon, you mentioned kind of putting a business case together, and I think that's a great way to look at it. And, you know, you can also, the more skills you attain, the more um, attractive you are to your current bosses, to maybe a future employer, and, you know, you can use that as an opportunity to potentially ask for more money down the line. You know, if you take on a new skill that they were planning to outsource um, to a third party and you're able to take it on yourself and keep it within the company without having an impact on your current role, you could save uh, the business a lot of money and use that as um, leverage in the future to say, hey, I saved you. 20%, so can I have a 10% raise? Because, that, <laughs> you know, that would work for that. So Love it. Important to be, so, yeah, I think it's important to be thinking about, um, you know, how that skill can help you down the line. I don't necessarily think that's an appropriate thing to do when you're trying to just get the skill. But once you have it and you mastered it, you can kind of use it to your advantage going forward. I actually really love that. Uh, I love that idea because, uh, to be honest, uh, I think uh, that uh, many people don't walk. They don't know when to to um, to you know what what are the tools to use to to negotiate their salaries and their raises. And I like the idea of walking in 
um, at your review and sort of highlighting all the wonderful things you've done as well as um, how much money you saved the organization and uh, making sure that you get your fair share and your fair, um, your fair raise. I think that's a good idea. Really good. Okay. Anything else on that question? Okay, so I am. Uh, we're, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about third-party experts, but only in terms of. I, I think I'm just going to uh, turn it over to the panel and say, other than you know, when you're thinking about uh, um, third-party experts, here are some of the key elements that you want to be thinking about. Sort of what expertise do they bring to the table, and how do they help me? Um, of course, that quality. Um, and then uh, there are some, you know, uh, reasons why you would do it. Does it help with management of the team and management of clients? Does it help streamline that or not? Um, um, but we're getting to the end. We only have a couple minutes left before we turn it over to questions. So um, I'd, I'd ask Abby or Cindy or Kristen if you'd add anything else to what we have on this on the slide here. Yeah, sure. The only thing I would add to this list is flexibility. Um, I think I know for my law firm, you know, that's a huge kind of selling point for the firm is that we're very flexible and we um, a adapt with our clients' changing needs. And every client is different and has their own unique set of needs. And we kind of pride ourselves on being able to, to meet them where they are and to change and grow with them where they are. So I think any third-party expert or vendor that you have has to mirror your core philosophies. And I think that's just something important to keep in mind when you're um, maybe getting bids in or just considering different uh, experts. Sharon, it's Chris. I'd like to add something about the use of third-party experts, and that's going to lean into quality of life. I mean, this is going to sound kind of interesting. When you have a third-party expert, whether you've retained them on a full-time basis or they're providing a service, their availability is very important to you. And I'm just going to lean back onto a true life story I had. It was 4 o'clock on a Friday. And this is before the advent of any online tools where a client had called and decided that they wanted to do a PCT national stage filing that was due on Tuesday. And um, they needed quotations as quickly as possible. I was planning to go to the beach with my kids that weekend, but I ended up spending the weekend reaching out to 20 different foreign agents to prepare a budget for this client. So I think if you have an expert um, in your toolbox, as I like to say, whether it's a, somebody you have that you use regularly or somebody who has a platform that you can access online, that it's important to have them there too, just for when these things happen. And for me, I could have spent the weekend at the beach for my kids. For you, it could be something completely different. But having a third-party expert or vendor in your toolbox is a good thing to have. Very good. Um, and then here are the considerations. You guys are going to get a copy of this presentation, so you'll be able to peruse this, um, this list. But choosing your third-party provider is pretty important, no matter what uh, it is. And uh, what we run up against all the time in the work that we do uh, when, we bring in, when we bring on a new client, we really like to meet with the team and understand how the work's being done today and then how we fit into the process. And we always recommend a pilot. So we work on a pilot and say, here's, here's the group that's assigned. So it's somebody from, um, from our, our, the team that we're working with, um, uh, the new client, the new company, the new law firm, um, and our team. And sometimes there's a third party involved, like a law firm. So if we're working with a corporation and a law firm and us and trying to triangulate that. And oftentimes we'll bring the team together and say, hey, okay, this is how we think this is going to go. Um, this is where we think we're going to get the, the, the most streamlined um, approach. And then we'll implement that in a pilot and then we'll tweak it before we do full implementation. And really you want to have a partner as you're going through because this, this um, we, we've, we have so many customers that say, oh, no, we've tried that. We don't want to work with you guys because we've tried it in the past, hasn't worked. 
And one of the things that um, we like to say is, you know, but um, but really, did they get um, did they work with you as a partner to figure out what's best for you? And not always all of our services are best. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about before we uh, we get into the uh, get into the questions, we'll have a couple minutes for that. Is really this that readiness for change? And I put this pretty common change process up here. Um, as a thought for how you want to be thinking about your um, change management, whether it's redesigning the department, whether it's bringing in a third party or um, managing your resources or actually improving the skill set within your team to add value within the organization. Um, it's really starting with that evaluate in the top right-hand corner, just really evaluating what's the end goal. Are you trying to get cost savings? Are you trying to get a data-centric team, you know, evaluate your current state um, and do a gap analysis. What are the systems, data, and skills that are needed? Um, and before you move forward, getting that key stakeholder alignment, making the case for change, you know, what are the organizational design? What, what is the impact on the people and processes um, contracts that are, that are, um, um, that are going to be impacted by this change? And then really managing the internal team. What's their changing roles? Hiring for the new skills or training for the new skills, developing the new processes, and then implementation. And then once you put that in place, it's constant measurement and adjusting and get that feedback loop with your business partners. And, um, and this is really a, a really common process to use, um, but I would say use it even for a small thing, even for a small change, really think about the steps. Uh, because uh, oftentimes things fail not because it isn't a good idea um, or the right thing to do, but because um, you didn't get um, the alignment that you needed or uh, 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 the buy-in that you needed or listen. Um, so that's what uh, so that's sort of that change process. And so, uh, Abby, uh, uh, do you have you gone through this process? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're kind of constantly going through this process, you know, in many different ways. And I think, you know, my biggest tip is to just consider how the change will impact others. You know, first you have to take a look at yourself and say, how is this change going to impact me and how do I feel about it? But if you feel good about it, don't automatically assume that it's going to work for everyone else. So you kind of have to put yourself in, in other shoes so that you know, oh, you can anticipate, okay, what might be the issues with this change and um, address those at the start. Very good. Um, uh, Cindy, do you have anything to add to this, uh, to this slide? Well, it's just um, you have changes going on all the time, so you need to make sure that you've assessed it and that um, – everyone is okay with it because if you've got, you know, majority of people just hating it, it will never get implemented. So it's important that you have good communication and that you're talking and um, you have the best out there that you can possibly find. Great. So Kristen, do you have anything, anything else to add? Yeah. Change is inevitably scary. Um, again, making sure you have everybody on board, the right team members, and implementing the change is, is going to be a little tough, but it's going to be successful and benefit you in the long run. So never be afraid of change. Great. And I think we're getting to the point where we have to go to questions, so I won't cover um, all that we do for, for uh, Delegate, but um, I know that we can help you as you're working through some of these decisions that we've talked about today. Um, you know what? I think we're actually over our time, so well, that's okay, uh, Karen. Um, we could just do a couple minutes left for any questions that haven't been answered. Um, if you have a question, please chat your question to all participants. So we'll give another minute or two. But that might be it. Um, so, any other questions? No, I think that's great. Oh, uh, thank you okay. so much to the ALA and oh, to you, course. Tiffany. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for attending today's webcast, IT Department of the Future, Advice from Your Peers. Uh, thank you to our panel and a big thanks to our sponsor today, Delegate. Uh, for, uh, as a reminder, please take a look at our event calendar for upcoming webcasts and a recording of this will be in your inbox tomorrow. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. This was great. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you, everyone, for attending. The recording will be available at legalmarketplace.alanet.org. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.